Hello and thank you for watching my video about the homebrew computer I'm building. So this has been inspired by projects that I've seen on the internet over the years where I wanted to build a homebrew that had a few more features than some that I found and would sit alongside the computers of the early 80s that one would have found in homes and schools in the UK. So something that essentially would be equivalent to something like the BBC Micro or the Commodore 64 or my first computer which was the Auric 1. So what I've decided is to go with a 6502 as the CPU and uh, what you can see here is my breadboard with all the bits and pieces which I'll now start explaining. Uh, 6502 was the heart of the Auric 1 as well as the BBC Micro and the Commodore 64 and because in the early 80s I learnt how to program a 6502 in machine code I thought this would be a good start for my homebrew. Um, if I zoom out slightly what you can actually see is the homebrew computer which is a bunch of breadboards with wires and some chips on it are actually housed in a BBC Micro case and I've also used the BBC Micro keyboard and wired that up to my breadboard and that's what I'm using for input. The 6502 on its own would be useless so I have a number of supporting chips. The um, 6522, I've got a couple of those which uh, I use for providing input output facilities, in particular uh, the keyboard and also driving one of my support chips which is the sound chip sound chip which is under this breadboard here which I'll explain in a moment is an AY38910 uh, that was found in the Oric 1 but also on the MSX range of computers uh, the other bit of I have got here is some mass storage so I've got an SD card breakout board here with a 1 gig card in it um, it's controlled through the 6502 so I'm doing software bit banging to uh, put the bits in and out of the SD card um, which means it's not very fast but around 4 or 5k a second is plenty good enough um, but the interesting thing about it was how to program a basic set of FAT16 routines using 6502 and a limited amount of ROM and RAM. Um, on the subject of ROM and RAM I have an EE PROM which is 16k for my uh, machine code monitor, my basic operating system, my basic input output drivers and also my programming language which I'll talk about in a separate video. I've got 128k of SRAM installed on the board with only 64k addressable and in fact only 44k available and um, two things one is that I'm using SRAM rather than dynamic RAM because it's far easier to work with and um, the reason for 44k rather than 48k available is that this section here which is the IO decoding board essentially maps just below the the top 16k of address space it maps um, f 8 lots of 0.5k uh, addressable windows for, uh, for, for basically my support chips so that's uh, what I use to access the, the 265 22s and the 6551 which is over here which is for serial input output something that wasn't really that common in the 80s but it's absolutely in, essential for building a computer now so I can use the PC to communicate with this this design in its early days um, and I needed that serial chip because the video until I got the video working then it wasn't really possible to see or do anything with the computer uh, and on the subject of video the chip that you see just here is a TMS 9918 uh, which was found in the MSX range of computers um, but instead of driving that chip using dynamic RAM what I've got here are some latches which actually connects to some SRAM over here um, and because the TMS was designed for dynamic RAM the latches are needed to be able to store and uh, decode the row and address row and column address strobes um, uh, which, which I didn't work out all by myself there were, there were some great instructions on the internet on, on how to do this 
Um, so what that gives me is a, is a nice bit of uh, video capability. I've got a 40 column mode uh, in two colors. I've got a 32 column mode in multicolor. And I've also got uh, a multi-color block mode um, and also 32 sprites uh, addressable, which actually means that some reasonably okay looking graphics can be created for games, for example. Um, so in addition, um, this piece over here is the master clock circuitry and reset circuitry. So I've got a 21 megahertz clock which is divided by two as the input to the video chip and then divided by another four times to be the master clock for the 6502. Uh, that means it's running at 2.68 megahertz. Now in the early 80s, no 6502s ran that quickly, but this is a Western Design Center modern CMOS version of the 6522. And it can run up to 14 megahertz, but uh, to be able to get everything working I'm, I'm running at much slower speed uh, breadboards whilst they're easy to work with aren't necessarily great at being able to propagate fast signals uh, cleanly or reliably um, I've got quite a few wires here the black wires which are generally ground and I've had to judiciously populate my breadboard with lots of ground wires because sometimes it can behave in an odd way for uh, unknown reasons but generally it's been quite reliable once I've kind of done stuff like that um, I've generally found it to be quite reliable so what we have here then is the starting point of a discussion about what the software is which I'm going to do in a separate video because there's there's a lot behind it but before I close this video, the point about the software, of course, is that I'm quite pleased with the hardware that I've built, but without software, the hardware is completely useless. So it was really interesting to start thinking about the software, what it, what I needed to do, how I should structure that. Um, the, the fascinating thing is, of course, that any computer that you see and touch has some software making it work everything from a key press to the cursor flashing to a single byte going in and out of the serial port all requires some code um, and that actually has taken longer and has been more complicated to implement than the hardware so I hope that was uh, interesting thank you for watching my video maybe you've been inspired to look at it yourself I've actually got a website on Hackaday uh, which has got all the source code for the software and various discussions about my experiences in designing and building this homebrew computer. So um, feel free to uh, look it up and uh, thank you again for watching this video.